The elegant spiral staircases, designed for moving between the first and second floors of the Boeing 747, and the act of sending airborne postcards from the skies, are perhaps the most unforgettable experiences of the golden age of flights. Today, let's explore 15 air travel features from the golden age of flying. But first, don't forget to subscribe to the channel to support Memory Lane. Elegant Design Did you know that airplanes once featured spiral staircases? As commercial planes first graced the skies, the realm of architecture soared alongside them. The aesthetics of aviation significantly shaped the design of airports and the interiors of aircraft. Take, for instance, the Boeing 747, unveiled in 1970, transcending its role as a mere aircraft to become a design masterpiece. Sporting two stories linked by a spiral staircase, its cabins were capable of accommodating over 500 passengers. The impact of aviation design didn't confine itself to the airborne realm. It also left an indelible mark on terrestrial structures, exemplified by the TWA terminal at JFK Airport. Designed by Eero Serenin, this architectural gem mimics the grace of a bird in flight. Airline Postcards In the bygone era of aviation, sending postcards from the skies was a delightful tradition. Airlines used to furnish special postcards for passengers during their flights, providing a unique way to capture moments above the clouds. Individuals could pen messages on these cards, whether recounting their travel adventures or simply sending greetings from the lofty heights. Upon landing, these airborne postcards were then mailed, bridging distances and conveying warm wishes from one corner of the globe to another. This practice predates the ubiquity of smartphones and the internet, making sending a postcard a popular means of staying connected. Today, these in-flight postcards have become rare collectibles, cherished by enthusiasts for their distinctive history and inherent charm. Tarmac Boarding In the era preceding the advent of jet bridges, passengers seeking a taste of celebrity life would disembark from airplanes using air stairs or mobile stairways. This unconventional boarding method allowed them to directly touch the tarmac, feeling the breeze and gaining a close-up view of the airport surroundings as they descended. Air stairs were a prevalent feature in various aircraft, including the renowned Boeing 727 and the McDonnell Douglas DC-9. They offered increased autonomy from ground services, proving particularly valuable at smaller airports lacking advanced infrastructure. Notably, air stairs played a distinctive role in 1971 when hijacker D.B. Cooper executed his audacious escape by parachuting from the rear of a Boeing 727. Flight Engineers In the earlier days of aviation, flight engineers played a pivotal role comparable to that of pilots in operating airplanes. Also referred to as air engineers, these professionals were integral members of an aircraft's crew, entrusted with the management and operation of the complex systems vital to flight. While they didn't physically pilot the plane, they operated a specialized panel to monitor and control critical components, such as engines and other essential flight systems. Collaborating closely with pilots, particularly during takeoff, flight, and landing, these engineers ensured the seamless operation of all systems. Historically, larger planes depended on the expertise of flight engineers, but with advancements in modern technology, computers now handle the majority of their responsibilities. Northwest Airlines, the last major U.S. passenger airline utilizing flight engineers, retired their final planes equipped with engineer stations in 2009. Spacious seating. In the past, enjoying ample legroom on an airplane didn't require contortionist skills. Airplane cabins were less congested, featuring seats that were wider and provided more legroom, enhancing the overall comfort of flights. This additional space allowed passengers to 
unwind and savor their journey without feeling confined. It was an era when air travel embodied a luxurious experience rather than merely a means of transportation from point A to point B. Airlines prioritized passenger comfort over cramming as many seats as possible. With the seat pitch, the distance between seats, measuring around 36 to 40 inches back then, compared to today's 28 inches. Fashionable attire. Gone were the days of catching someone in pajamas on a plane. It was a veritable fashion show in the skies. During this era, both passengers and crew members donned their finest attire, transforming air travel into a high society affair. Men in suits and ties and women in elegant dresses and hats were a common sight, treating flying as a prestigious event. Flight attendants, or stewardesses as they were then known, showcased eye-catching uniforms crafted by renowned fashion houses such as Christian Dior and Chanel. This chic approach to air travel elevated the experience, making it glamorous and unforgettable. The fashion-forward atmosphere was so pronounced that some airlines even hosted in-flight fashion shows, turning the aisles into impromptu runways. Believe it or not, there was a time when live piano music accompanied flights through the clouds. In the 1970s, certain first-class sections of airplanes resembled flying luxury lounges, complete with cocktail bars and pianos. These lounges provided a space for passengers to unwind, socialize, and enjoy a drink or two. The pianos, often electric keyboards or organs, created an atmosphere akin to a sophisticated party in the sky, allowing travelers to relax and even sing along to tunes played by the onboard pianist. Notably, American Airlines gained fame for its economy class piano bar at the rear of their 747 cabin, democratizing the joy of live music for a broader range of passengers. Gourmet Meals Envision yourself seated on a plane, being served a sophisticated dinner reminiscent of a high-end restaurant. In the bygone era of air travel, the expectation was gourmet meals that transcended mere in-flight sustenance. Skilled chefs crafted these multi-course feasts, featuring delicacies such as carved roast beef or turkey. What elevated the experience even further was the presentation, all served on fine china with real silverware. This attention to detail transformed the act of flying into a truly luxurious event, where the culinary journey was as integral as the destination. As an epitome of extravagance, Olympic Airways even went so far as to furnish gold-plated cutlery in their first-class cabins. Simple security. There existed a time when boarding a plane resembled the simplicity of hopping onto a bus, with airport security adopting a more relaxed stance. There was no need to arrive hours in advance, remove your shoes, or fret over the volume of liquids in your carry-on. During this era, concerns about metal detectors causing passenger unease and violating privacy were prevalent. However, this laid-back approach underwent a transformation over time, particularly as the incidence of hijackings increased. Between May 1961 and the conclusion of 1972, there were 159 aircraft hijackings in U.S. airspace. A significant shift occurred when New Orleans International Airport became the first to implement metal detectors in 1970, marking a substantial stride towards the security protocols familiar to us today. Onboard smoking. Once resembling airborne lounges, airplanes permitted smoking as a regular and accepted practice. During that period, numerous flights designated specific areas solely for smoking, providing passengers with the freedom to enjoy cigarettes or cigars. It may be difficult to fathom now, but individuals used to smoke right in their seats, creating cabins filled with smoke. In an era predating widespread awareness of the detrimental health effects of smoking, this practice went largely unquestioned. In fact, flight attendants would routinely distribute cigarettes as part of their service. 
The conclusion of this era came in the year 2000 with the departure of the last U.S. flight allowing smoking, marking the end of an era where indulging in in-flight smoking was considered an integral part of the journey. Unaccompanied minors. All airlines used to fly kiddies to and from their parents and boarding schools. They were called unaccompanied minors. They had special badges, and a hostess would see them through transit from one plane to another. Few airlines now offer this service meaning that kids effectively have to be always accompanied by an adult. Kids usually got a trip to the cockpit, free gifts like badges and decks of cards, with, of course, the airline logo on the back, and had their Junior Jet Club album signed by the pilot. Airlines knew that their young customers helped breed brand loyalty. This category of passenger is barely tolerated these days, as they occupy a seat but pay a lower price. And as flying is commoditized, they aren't a market target anymore. Mar it wasn't that safe. The classic aircraft of the early jet era was the Boeing 707, which outsold most other comparable jetliners combined. It has an inbuilt tendency to Dutch roll basically wagging its tail in the air, which could develop into a dangerous instability if uncorrected. Consequently, it was challenging to fly. The first jet airliner, the Comet, suffered metal fatigue issues leading to fatal crashes. Early jet engines weren't that reliable either, which is why most planes had four, so the flight could still go on if a couple of them failed. Without sophisticated avionics, such as weather radar, flights weren't able to predict accurately what they'd be flying through. Rudimentary radar on the ground meant that mid-air collisions happened. They're virtually unheard of now, several times. Then there was always the risk of getting hijacked. With the cockpit always open so kids could come and have their view of it, and privileged adult passengers too, anyone could walk into the cabin and demand to be taken to Cuba. It was expensive, and it was chic. A first-class cabin on an Emirates. A380 will set you back about 30,000 USD, but flying wasn't much cheaper in the golden age. A second-class seat from Paris to London would set you back pound 50 when an annual wage was around 2,000 pounds. No wonder flying was for the rich and glamorous. To be a member of the jet set meant that you had made your place in the world. Mass tourism only really came in with the jumbo jet, the 747, which democratized flying. No special treatment in customs. There were no air bridges in those days. After being cosseted in jet set luxury, you'd need an umbrella at Heathrow or a fur coat at Sheremetyevo because you walked out onto the tarmac and walked, sometimes a considerable distance to the air terminal. When you got there, there was no air conditioning or at best rudimentary heating while you went through customs and immigration. Without a Schengen zone, passport-free European states, there was no relief from the indignities of having your baggage opened and searched, filling in immigration forms and showing your passport. Not to mention the restrictions on the amount of money you could take abroad and currency restrictions on how much of it you could change into foreign currency but there were compensations. Seat side service. The wide aisle of the 707 meant that first class passengers enjoyed seat side service from the rotisserie. Pan Am realized early that they couldn't compete with the chic airlines like Air France. So they teamed up with Maxims of Paris to handle their transatlantic catering. By modern standards, the food wasn't that exotic. Tornados Rossini turns up a lot, but the wine list is to die for. No one seemed too concerned about people getting off the aircraft sozzled because a typical menu for a transatlantic flight was an aperitif, two wines and a scotch or brandy after. As many top-ups as you'd care for. Of course, jet setters wouldn't have to worry about drinking and driving after a flight. They'd have a chauffeur for that. No in-flight entertainment. Movies? In-seat entertainment? No. 
The technology wasn't up to it. Your entertainment was conversation with your fellow jet setters, flirting with the hostesses, as flight attendants were called in those days, smoking, drinking, and eating, and playing patience with a set of mini-sized BOAC playing cards designed to fit onto the fold-down tray. Hostesses were the in-flight entertainment. Most passengers were male, in a male-dominated era. They were not primarily considered, as they are now, as safety specialists concerned about getting people off the aircraft quickly in the event of an accident. They were expected to be female, under 32, unmarried, and sexy. Singapore Airlines still projects this image of the Singapore girl as being a suitable subject of lust. And how about you? If there's a particular aspect of flights that has left a lasting impression on you, feel free to share your thoughts in the comments. Wishing you a wonderful day, and don't forget to subscribe to the Memory Lane channel.